So let me introduce today's speaker, Dr. Mohammad Mahbub Rahman, who is working as a staff researcher at Digital Health Lab in Samsung Research, America, Silicon Valley, California. His research interests include variable physiological computing, acoustic sensing, and multimodal sensor fusion to uh, develop novel algorithms and mobile systems to track human health and behavior in free living conditions. These are very interesting topics, I guess. And he has been publishing papers in top tier computing venues, really top tier, because they include CHI, IM, WUT, that's the Ubicom, then Mobile, HCI, Parcom, among several others. He has already published uh, more than 40 peer reviewed papers and filed more than 11 patents. That's an amazing number, 11 patents. That's a kind of rare from us. And his paper has received the industry track based paper award at IEEE Parcom 2020. That, that is one of the top venue in pervasive computing. Uh, Mahbub's vision is to democratize healthcare and improve quality of life by making healthcare services available through low cost mobile devices. I guess that's, that's very applicable to uh, the context of Bangladesh. And uh, he, he also worked as a research uh, scientist in Nokia Digital Health Lab in Silicon Valley. He has completed his BSc in the department of CSC grid, that's our department. Uh, and uh, he finished his PhD in the computer science, having the specialization in a mobile health from the University of Memphis, Tennessee, USA in 2016. His dissertation was on utilizing wearable uh, physiological sensors for monitoring psychosocial stress in the field. His current research uh, fo uh, focuses on uh, monitoring chronic respiratory patients using mobile devices. I think this is a very interesting topic. And now I would like to welcome uh, Dr. Mahabub, please. Thank you, Razi, for the introduction. And also I want to thank Mahmoud, Madam, and Ati for inviting me and arranging the talk. And I also want to thank all of the audience for the time and interest in this topic. And uh, today I will be talking about how mobile health research have a potential to democratize healthcare. By democratize, I mean everyone, including poor and rich, can have access to healthcare. Sometimes the, the healthcare services are not available to all class of people, but I feel that we can change the paradigm through this mobile health research. This is my personal opinion and all the presentation or discussion that I will be talking in this uh, session is my personal opinion. It's nothing about Samsung product or anything related to Samsung. Although the papers that I published as part of Samsung team, those are already in public information. There is no confidentiality here. And I welcome questions and I, I try to try my best to give answers of the, uh, about the questions. And, Another thing I want to highlight is that the talk I will be giving today is mostly high level overview of the publications that I have done as a team member or as a lead author. And also I will be focusing on some of the papers and topics from others, other researchers, not from Samsung or not from me because it is related to mobile health research and related to respiratory diseases. First, I want to start with, uh, again, a brief introduction. I, we already have the introduction from uh, Dr. Uh, Ali Malrazi. And again, I, I completed my computer uh, uh, BSc in computer science and engineering from Buet in 2006. And then I, I have completed my PhD in 2016 from University of Memphis. And then I, uh, before PhD, I worked in Ecatel, which is now Roby. I worked as an engineer for two and a half years there before starting my PhD. And after PhD, I have started my uh, industry research career in digital health lab at Nokia Tech, which was also in Silicon Valley. And then I switched to digital health lab. The name is same, company is different, Samsung Research America, which is also a kind of neighboring office. So I already published my uh, 40 plus papers and 12 plus filed 12 plus patents. And I welcome anyone to visit my Google Scholar profile 
And if anyone has any interest on any of the papers that have questions and suggestions, I will come to reach out to me. So the first I want to motivate the audience why mobile health research can be interesting research idea and can help democratize healthcare, specifically countries like Bangladesh where healthcare is not available and not only in Bangladesh, even in US, you have seen the scenario in New York. A lot of people have died when we had the peak infection for COVID-19. And even US, which is, uh, which is one of the top advanced country, we, we thought it, it may not happen, but it is happening. And also it is continuing to other states. So if we focus on Bangladesh, since all of most of us or all of us are from Bangladesh, so we see the number of hospitals in Bangladesh is around 5,200. So this is very low compared to how many people we have, 180 million, it's a huge population. And out of those hospitals, very small portion, like around 12% are government hospital. Government, government hospitals are low cost hospital, low cost services, but private hospital, which is around 80 88% of the hospitals, those are really expensive. Not many people can afford uh, private hospitals. And uh, even I, for my family, this is same. I am also from middle-class family and we may not, I may not afford these private hospitals in Bangladesh. And this is the overall hospital number of hospital situation. How about hospital bed? So we have in Bangladesh, for every 10,000 people, we have 80 hospitals for every 10,000. And this is number of hospital bed. And if we talk about ICU, because recently COVID-19 infection remind us the ICU more because a lot of people needed ICU at the same time. An ICU ratio is expected 10 is to one. That means if any hospital has 10 regular bed, they should have one ICU. But in Bangladesh, the situation is really, really scaring. We have ICU bed for every 220 regular bed, which is really low. We have low number of hospitals, less number of hospital beds, and ICU bed is really, really low. And ICU bed access is also very expensive. That's why this is the situation in Bangladesh. And I believe this situation is similar in other countries, and maybe in, in Asia or maybe Africa, many other countries is having similar or worse situation. However, countries like Bangladesh, we have one really good thing that most of the people, maybe 100% has some kind of phone. Some of them have smartphone, some of them has feature phone. But phone, as you see highlighted in this, um, in this page, is we are one of the top mobile is using country in, in the world. And we have almost, it's 98%, I would say 100%. Some of them have multiple mobile phones, right? These are the statistics I got from U Wikipedia. So can we use this, in, uh, this connection in favor of reducing the burden on our healthcare? So this is how mobile health research can, can play a role. Here I, in, this, in this slide, I'm, I'm talking about the sensing capabilities on smartphones. The smartphones has many sensing capabilities, for example, it has microphone, even any, any phone has microphone. Without microphone, we cannot, we cannot talk, right? So every phone has microphone and most of the phone, maybe all phone has camera now. Camera, microphone, those are very common. Mo most of the, or all of the smartphone, uh, smartphones has accelerometer, gyroscope, light sensing, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, a lot of things. So can we use those sensing capability? to monitor the user, uh, their own health. And then maybe we can do some pre-screening that can help reduce some of the burden that our healthcare system is taking, especially during this pandemic. 
So if we have some kind of solution that, that can help reduce those burden and make the available service available to the people who are really in need. Maybe I, ha I have some symptom, not severe, but if I go to hospital and if I have more money, maybe I am getting access to hospital bed, ICU bed, but someone else who does not have money, but really in bad condition, they are not getting the right access. So not only the phone, how about watch? Right now, smartwatch has also a lot of sensing capabilities similar to smartphone, like it has accelerometer, gyroscope, magnetometer, those are motion sensing capability. And also it has photoplethysmography, ECG, even ECG, you heard the news like Apple has ECG sensing capability with the watch. And also heart rate capability is, heart rate sensing capability is very common in most of the watches. And not only watch, there are other devices called chest band. I have one for, uh, as an example, like this one is a, a chest band, which can give us ECG, respiration, motion detection, activity detection, and it has Bluetooth connection. It can be connected with the phone and passively collect all the data. So physiological data, motion data, and, and other behavioral data using just one device. But as you see, this is not comfortable. We, we, we may not have this thing, this is expensive, but we all have phone. Again, what is the uh, mobile health research? We are talking about mobile devices. This, anything, the, any device that can be portable, can be carried with the person or the user and has connection with the phone. And then we can monitor, monitor any parameter, health, behavior, or any physiological sensing then we can say this is part of mobile health. And mobile health is not the health of the phone. It is about the health of the phone user. This is sometimes people may get, get confused who are not familiar in this, in this field. As you see in this picture, heart rate is shown and ECG is shown. So this is connected with some of the, maybe the, this is chest band, ECG sensing capability, and then heart rate and heart rate variability, stress, those can be monitored passively, so user don't need to do anything. It, it can run in the background, or sometimes we can ask user to perform certain tasks, and then we can monitor their health, overall health condition. Although I'm talking about the feasibility of using mobile devices to monitor a lot of disease conditions, but particularly in this talk, I will be talking about respiratory diseases. And as you see, the COVID-19 is a respiratory disease. And because of that, people are having more interest on, on, on knowing more on respiratory diseases. And there are two types, grossly two types of respiratory disease. One is chronic disease, like COPD, which is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And another is asthma. Those are chronic disease. If someone has those diseases, it does not cure. So they need to maintain the condition to, uh, to improve their quality of life. Because if there is an asthma attack, we cannot breathe, we cannot do our regular activities. Even daily activities like going to um, grocery may not be possible. Every, uh, many other activities will be limited. Why? Because when there is an inflammation inside the lung or the airway, like we breathe in, the the air is going from nose to the lung and there is a channel which are which are the airways if it is infl inflamed the the tube becomes smaller then someone cannot breathe and that's why oxygen saturation goes down and also uh, they uh, they cannot they need to catch up their breath even speaking is difficult during that time and another is influenza which is commonly called as flu and and COVID-19 is, is, the, is the new one, which, we, which was not familiar with, with us before maybe December 2019. But it is causing pandemic. And it is also, again, respiratory disease doing similar thing as, COVID, uh, as COPD asthma attack. Like uh, they cannot breathe, the oxygen saturation goes down, and, and coughing, a lot of other symptoms. But those can be monitors using, using phone. But just to give 
a broader examples of what are the mobile health use case that, that we can see in our daily life. This is one example that is showing like act, we can monitor activity, we can monitor eating, how someone is eating something, is it, is it healthy eating behavior or not, drinking behavior, exercise, those things can be, can be monitored using maybe smartwatch or phone or combination of multiple devices. But those are data measurement and, and the monitoring. So those things can be shown in a nice visualization to motivate the user. Sometimes in, in, in the interface, there can be some computation across peers, like, okay, we want to improve our healthy, healthy behavior. We may, not be, um, we may not be motivated enough to engage with these activities. That's why sometimes gaming, uh, social, I mean, social competition, like if we create a group of 10, 10 friends and then we compete each other, how many steps we have or how much calorie we burn, we can monitor and then, then keep our, ourselves healthy. So towards behavior modification through some visualization and reflection on the, on the mobile device. These are all fitness thing. Another category is the, another category is the health monitoring. Like at this moment, people are looking for um, pulse oximeter to monitor oxygen saturation in the blood. As you see in the, in the left picture, this is the device, portable device. When we, we put the finger, this is, this is called fingertip pulse oximeter. We put the finger, there is a light sensor which, which emits the light and get the reflection from the finger and then measure the blood oxygen saturation. And also Samsung has some of this capability on the phone. As the, uh, there is a light sensor be, uh, behind the phone. And if we put the finger and it, we keep it quiet, we measure it for a few seconds, it shows oxygen saturation. There are a lot of, lot of things uh, related to accuracy because you know, when we are talking about consumer grade assessment, we cannot rely on those assessment as a clinical grade because clinical grade is the gold standard, but consumer grade has, may have more uh, inaccuracy or, or accuracy issue, but in that case, you, we need to follow how to measure those things. If it is measured properly, most of the time, it should give good, uh, good accuracy. But these are the examples that I'm sh showing that may be relevant for the, uh, for the audience who are new in mobile health area. So now I'll be talking about the papers that I have, uh, I have published in, um, on monitoring respiratory uh, respiratory features, respiratory markers or conditions using smartphone and smartwatch. So those are, these are the paper. Again, I, I want to highlight that these are very high level and I can go into detail based on interest because there are a lot of papers I'm covering in, in one session. So here in this particular slide, I'm talking about respiration monitoring breathing rate monitoring. So breathing rate monitoring usually chest band, when this chest band, which is cumbersome, it is on under, underneath the clothing around the chest. Then when we breathe in like, so breathe in, breathe out, this, this band has some flexi, uh, flexible way to, to measure the motion of the rib cage and then measure breathing rate. Breathing rate, as you, you see, breathing rate can be very interesting data for, uh, for estimating breathlessness. For example, if I have breathlessness issue because of asthma attack or COVID-19 issue, then we, will have, we need to, to catch our breath or I need to catch the breath more frequently means breathing rate will be high. Number of breaths per minute will be high, higher than my baseline when I was not having any issue. So, since these are these are expensive, so I got I got the idea that okay, how about the phone? We make the phone uh, useful for this situation. We don't need continuous monitoring of respiration rate because respiration rate does not change every minute. It changes maybe hours or several hours. After several hours, it may change one one breath per minute. So in from that idea, I thought okay, how about we just hold the phone on the chest? Test, uh, and the phone has sensing capability. One is microphone, another is motion sensing. So motion can be captured by, by this phone itself. And also 
the microphone can listen the sound around the LAN. And then can we analyze the data using machine learning and signal processing techniques and estimate, estimate breathing rate and other breathing uh, related parameters. And this is the paper that I have published in Body, uh, Body Nets in 2018, which is estimating respiration rate just from motion sensor. We have six axis motion sensor or three axis accelerometer, three axis gyroscope. And as you see in the, in the example here, this is just one, one example that we can detect the breathing cycle and peaks of the breathing cycle. And based on the one minute number of breaths in, in a minute, we can convert it to breathing rate. This is very simple and we can, we can measure it using just smartphone. We don't need chest band. And I compare this algorithm with the chest band because chest band is considered as the ground truth. And I have seen that it is very comparable and sometimes it is performing better. Another thing, as I mentioned, when we hold the phone on the chest, it is capturing motion at the same time sound. If I have breathing, breathing issue, like asthma after asthma attack or COPD exacerbation, or maybe even COVID-19 who are having breathlessness, like <laughs> so those are the sound that, that are captured. Not only the lung sound, the sound is coming from nose and mouth. So those sound can be captured. As you see in here, the comparison of the sound between whois, whois is kind of a, the sound when we have the obstruction in the airway, we are breathing in and out. And because of the obstruction, obstruction there is some musical sound. And here in the spectrogram in the, of the whois sound, you see there are some note in particular frequency. And those notes can be, kept, uh, can be, uh, can be extracted from the, from the signal. And you see comp in comparison, if someone has cough, <coughs> the, the signal is different. And you see the, sh the difference between who is cough and like if I just do throat clearing. <clears throat> so those signals are different sound. And when we, we have this motion, breathing motion, plus the breathing sound together, then we can really est uh, uh, analyze and estimate the overall lung condition of the patient. This is the paper that, uh, that I have published in, in CHI this year. Uh, unfortunately, because of COVID-19, I did not have the presentation, but this is the paper I, I, I worked with my intern and published in, in CHI. And this is really, I mean, we get really good review that these are the work we needed uh, for monitoring or handling the situation at this moment. As, as you see, these are, the, these are the capabilities, but again, these are not, I'm not talking about that phone will be similar to stethoscope. No, it may not, it, it, it is not, because stethoscope is a device that, that is listening to the internal lung sound. But I'm, I'm showing that some of the analysis may be possible with the phone. And if we want to monitor the patient, maybe we need future studies to see how accurate with large scale population. Right now, the, the study that I have conducted, these are limited, like uh, 200 to 300 participants, a pulmonary patient. And, and still we see the good accuracy as, and, and we are showing the feasibility that these are possible. And from, now, from, from this point, other people can do more research and, and find um, handle other situation that may, may be not covered in this topic. Another is cough detection. So here, as you see, I started from breathing rate. Breathing rate is the physiology, basic physiological signal. But here I'm talking about wheezing. Wheezing is a symptom. And this symptom, when you combine symptom and the physiological signal together, we can have better condition estimation for pulmonary patient. For example, here, another symptom which is very common uh, for pulmonary patient is cough. COPD patient, they, they cough regularly. And sometimes when they cough, they have wheezing because <laughs> you see the during cough, we have force or more violence in the, in the sound and the air coming from the lung is having stronger sound. And when it is coming from uh, with, with greater force, there will be more musical note. And those can be captured using machine learning algorithm, signal processing algorithm combination, and, and then 
we can detect cough. And this is the paper that we have published in BodyNet 2018. And after this paper, we also analyze whether the cough can be used to monitor lung capacity. Because when someone is coughing, <coughs> you see how forceful. And this is, this is the uh, basic idea of spirometry. Like during spirometry, they need to blow, the user need to blow their breath into some, some uh, device called spirometer. This is one of the, uh, one example of um, uh, portable spirometer. They need to blow here. And while, co while they're coughing, people or, or the patient is passively doing the same thing, right? Here, this device is kind of active measurement. They need to blow here. But when there is a cough, they, they don't have control. Those are passive monitoring rather than asking them to perform some task. So that's the beauty of cough. And from the cough, we can analyze those, those metric, lung function capacity. Another thing is speech analysis. As I'm, I'm giving the speech, and as you see, the, when I'm speaking, I need more energy. And if I have breathlessness, if I have issue with my lung, lung inflammation, I cannot speak the speed I have as usual. As a baseline, I right now say I have a, this speed. If I have some lung condition, lung issue, asthma attack, I cannot the same uh, speak at the same rate. So those things can be captured using, using smartphone. When we are talking, it can be passive or it can be active like, okay, I am reading a paragraph. And recently I have seen one, uh, yeah, several work, they, they are saying, okay, they can, they can detect COVID-19 when they're speaking. I did not work on that, but I have seen some other uh, startup companies and other companies they are claiming that they can analyze and detect patient using speech. And this paper is published in Parcom, and I am also part of this effort. And another thing is mobile spirometry. As I mentioned, spirometry is the gold standard for measuring lung capacity. So how good is my lung? How, how, fun, how good is my lung functioning? So there are parameters called forced ex expiratory volume in one second. This is the most important parameter. And from, from the name, we can see forced expiratory volume. That means when someone is forcing their expiratory volume into some device, as you see in the picture, this is the clinical spirometry, spirometer. When someone is, the patient is sitting in the house, a special house, and it is connected with some big machine and then with the nose clip and then inserting the tube into the mouth and then the patient is blowing like, like this. So, so they, they need to continue this blowing onto the, uh, in, in, into the device as long as they can and as fast as they can. As you see, this is kind of a test. It is not passive. This is an active test, but this is expensive and not always available to, to the patient, all, to all the patients. And this is, here I'm showing clinical spirometry and recently there are uh, portable spirometer like this and portable spirometer are connected with the phone. When I'm blowing, the phone shows the the quality of the exhalation and based on the quality metric, it can measure whether my blowing qualifies to estimate my lung function. Because it is effort dependent. If I don't give my best effort, the parameter number will not be useful. So the idea that I have published and got the best paper award in Parcom to, uh, this year is that how about we just blow that breath on the phone because phone has microphone and microphone can capture the sound and the air pressure that we are blowing when phone is close to the mouth like like the picture the avatar is showing one one example like so when we are doing this and keeping the mouth in particular shape then the we can simulate the spirometry on the phone and based on that simulation spirometry simulation we can estimate the lung function if the quality of the effort is good enough. And, and, and this is, again, um, consumer-grade assessment. I, and it, it needs more studies. 
to deploy in the field. But the, in particular, in this paper, I was talking about some of the real life, uh, real life scenario. For example, the phone can be in any orientation or uh, the distance between the mouse and the phone can vary. So we cannot control those when the user is using. Can, we, can our algorithm handle those situation and still generate some meaningful number? So th that, was the, um, that was the main analysis of this paper. And another thing, like some people cannot blow because their condition is so bad that they cannot generate this forceful sound from, uh, from their exhalation. In that case, we, we, we develop another alternative, like they can create some sound like, ah, uh, so these are vocal sounds, some monosyllabic voice. And even from that voice, we can estimate lung function to some extent, maybe not as good as the force full exhalation, but still it may be useful for patients who are really in severe condition. As you see in this example, the person um, in the top graph, this is the example from a subject who has really bad condition. And then they cannot, they cannot continue the sound long enough. And the below one is the sound from someone who does not have lung obstruction, healthy subjects. And if you see the, the depth, the duration, and also the density of the signal is different from, from patient who has severe condition. And from this analysis, like a, a voice analysis, we, we extract features like MFCC, uh, chroma, and a lot of other features. And using the regression model to estimate lung function from just like ah sound just this sound for as long as they can and it is published in mobile sci this this year we will uh, it, it is not published yet that means uh, it is accepted and we will we will present soon okay so far i have i was talking about the work that we have done from samsung research america and right and this this work i am particularly focusing because this is related to COVID-19. This study is done in Stanford University and, and there is a preprint publication from this team. This is the work that is showing the feasibility of early detection, COVID-19 detection using smartwatch, just smartwatch. In the in the we see a lot of effort is going on for vaccine detection, antibody test, test kit, low cost test kit. Those are coming into news, but this this is the effort that is going on. Not only from Sam, uh, from Stanford, I have seen work from MIT group, Rosalind Pricard group. They they also are doing similar similar activity similar studies. Whether I mean studies on feasibility that phone or watch, can it detect COVID-19 early? As you see in this study, and in this graph, there is, uh, there is a possibility here, you, you see the heart rate overstep, the ratio between heart rate and step count. They show that they can detect those bump, as you see the red star, those bump early, uh, before, uh, ahead in time, before they have, they have the positive test, as you see vertical lines, they are showing, those are the showing up symptom and also the test positive. But as you see, the, the heart rate over step count is picking up ahead in time. Each, each line is one day. Sometimes they said it can be detected nine days ahead of the symptom. Because when we have infection, our physiological chains start picking up, but maybe we don't see the symptom yet. Uh, and also we, we don't go to uh, test ourselves. So they, those are the, uh, those are the, some of the issues why we see a lot of infection because asymptomatic patient, they are freely living with other, mixing with other people and sometimes they are, uh, they are helping to spread the device, which is, uh, sorry, sp uh, spread the disease, which should not be the case. But if we use mobile devices to, to give them early, indication that you may be a suspected patient, it can make a big difference. Although the accuracy is not 
there yet and this is an ongoing study but i feel this is how this is how mobile health can help in monitoring chronic disease and also monitoring uh, infectious disease like like covid-19 and also i have seen work from scripps translational um, institution they they have done it the similar studies with uh, influenza and they showed that they can track influenza like cdc uh, cdc curve when us uh, in in usa like in california texas or new york we have flu season and they they showed that they can, their model can track those flu and now they are extending this work into covid-19 uh, covid-19 detection using smartphone and smartwatch so those are the things that uh, that can be interesting and we want to see more success to improve the situation to contain this this pandemic as soon as possible to save lives and and save um, save uh, economy again so far i have showing the uh, showing the opportunities right there are a lot of opportunities monitoring smartphone smart devices which are part of our um, daily life but what are the challenges it is not just um, challenge free because as i mentioned when we are talking about smartphone spirometry the behavior the user behavior with the device has a great impact on how much how quality data we can collect from them and from as a, as you can see in the in many news that the spo2 measurement may have some some issue accuracy issue because maybe we don't measure it correctly and because maybe light condition is not perfect so there are a lot of issues can 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 affect our quality of the data when we are talking about consumer grade assessment and that's why i am saying when we measure something we have some suspicious uh, development physiological development we should talk to doctor and this is how the mobile health system can be connected with the traditional healthcare system and then make the service more scalable and then pre screen the patient based on uh, based on those symptom and and detection another challenge i would say privacy because my health my body is for this is this is about me i don't want to share this data about my lung condition about my heart condition about about my body behavior to anyone else so this is a real issue for example here i am showing about cough detection for cough detection we need audio but for audio some sometimes we are speaking and speech has very private information maybe i am speaking to my wife maybe i am speaking to someone with my social security number which is a very a very uh, private information i want i don't want to share but when we are recording audio it is capturing all of them can we do something to reduce some of the concern and we have published one work where it detects the speech or Uh, non cough sound and then obfuscate by obfuscate i'm saying it muffled the sound even the sound is uh, accessed by adversaries or people who we don't want to hear or we we don't want them to hear my speech they can see but they cannot understand anything like uh, obfuscating so the, there is no speech but cough is intact because i need the cough monitoring but i don't need speech i mean if we have particularly cough monitoring so the, i mean this is the, just an idea that we can obfuscate the unnecessary sound that may have private information in the data stream so this is the idea another thing is model generalizability sometimes we have a model from 100 subjects or 200 subjects we have collected data in the lab when we deploy it in the field because of behavior user behavior variation or because of different environmental condition those model does not generalize as as you see here in this graph in the in the right side this is one work we have published in uh, ebcom 2018 this is also a, an effort combined effort with with my wife this is the paper we have shown that lab data distribution is different from field data distribution and the features that we use like mfcc feature or like breath rate feature when we talk about when we talk about lab data collection the behavior is different than the field can we mitigate this behavior and then can we minimize the differences in distribution data distribution if we can do that 
and then model will be more generalizable. Those are the challenges. There are several ways to mitigate some of the challenges, but there is no silver bullet to handle all the challenges at, at, at one point. Yeah, these are the opportunities, challenges, and mitigation of challenges. But the thing that I want to highlight is that the mobile devices that is part of our life has the capability to be connected with the healthcare system uh, to make the healthcare more scalable. And, and we can, and mobile health research can reduce the burden of the healthcare system that we, we currently have. So there are a lot of opportunities to work and this is, these are just a few examples. There are many other good work from, from other researchers and I still feel that there is a lot of room for new research, new, uh, new ideas in, in this domain. This is quite, um, quite open, I, I, I believe. And if, we, if other, um, other talented minds work together and have collaboration, then it can be a different world than today. And here, this is the team that I work with. This is a combination of engineers, researchers, and UI UX designer, project managers. But I want to highlight that among, among this team, five of them, five of us, are from CSE Buet. So I am proud of all of the work we are doing. And these are the uh, Buetian that we are working in the same team. And they are doing really amazing job. And, and this is kind of branding. Uh, Bangladesh and branding do it. And I'm from 00, zero batch. We have Mehdi from 03, Mohsin from 04, Tausi from 06, and Bashima from 2010 batch. And thank you very much for your interest, in, in, uh, uh, attention, and interest. I can take questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Mahmoud, for the excellent talk. So I think it's the time to have some questions, and I can see. One hand already raising. Pritam Shahavarko, please go on with your question. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the presentation. Uh, I was thinking in the first few papers uh, you showed us that uh, you were taking measurements using phone, uh, I guess. Uh, right. Yes, in this slide and uh, and the next slide. Uh, so mm -hmm. the breath rate estimation in that case, the phone needs to be somewhere near the uh, chest or near the mouth. So uh, have you actually planned to use the phone like in the phone uh, in the shirt uh, in the pocket of the shirt or somewhere like that? Because uh, uh, without uh, keeping the phone in the pocket of the shirt, it's not actually possible to. Uh, monitor the rate regularly in a uh, continuous fashion. Right, right, yeah, yeah. That's, that's a very good point. And one thing that I have mentioned during the presentation that we don't need to me measure breath rate every minute. We don't need oh, continuous okay. Mo okay. For most okay. of the time. So when we need say, okay, so one measurement in the morning, one measurement in the evening, so they can just hold the phone on the chest for one minute. That's, oh, okay. that's enough. Okay for this measurement. So this is one, this is called active measurement, right? So we are, we need active participation from the user. But there are ways to do it passively, right? One way is using the chest band, which is expensive and not, not comfortable. But even if the phone, if it is around, around the person and breathing sound like, sound can be, ca kept, can be captured passively. And then, then we can monitor passive breathing rate. But accuracy will be different, right? Here, here is, this is the best accuracy you can expect when holding the phone on the chest. So it can be a combination of active and passive, but the hi highlight I want to show that respiration rate does not change quite often. And another point is that um, when we use uh, such mobile phones uh, in our day-to-day -day life, uh, in many cases, uh, there are tremendous amount of uh, uh, noise in the background, uh, like uh, we are moving uh, in a car or uh, we are walking in the street and uh, there are many types of noise around there. So how do you actually filter out those noise and just take the actual sound you need? Yes, yeah, so this is a challenging, challenging uh, situation, right? So when we are measuring outside, then there will be a lot of other sound. Even, even in, inside the home, we have air condition, refrigerator, maybe fan is moving. There are a lot of background noise that can affect different type of data in different intensities. For example, cough. 
sometimes cough is so strong, even if you have background noise, it may still be okay. But if we're talking about breathing, breathing sound, breathing sound is so, so weak that it can be obfuscated by background noise. In that case, we can think of multimodal approach, right? Multimodal approach means, for example, motion sensor. Even if we are, we are in a noisy environment, the motion does not, it does not affect the motion of my body, my breathing, right? So it does not affect me. So it depends on situation, how you handle. Sometimes multimodal sensing, sometimes one particular uh, sensing capability is better uh, to work better than others. So sound it may not be a good, good thing for breathing monitoring in a noisy environment, but motion sensor is still okay. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Take it. So any other question? I, I think Mahmouda Madam has a question. Madam, please go on. So, Mahmoud, madam, please go on. Can I get it? Yeah, yeah, madam. We can hear you. Okay. <laughs> that, if so, maybe it is the common question. What is the size of the data? One, one query. And uh, because you made some, uh, some, right, apps, and then you collected data, right? Right, right, yes. So, uh, and um, uh, what... Uh, there will be a different uh, type, uh, different age group, uh, mm -hmm, gender, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, th this kind. So what is the uh, size of the data? One question. Another mm -hmm. question for, uh, uh, from the speech, uh, speech analysis. Have you tried with the uh, physiological features? There's some uh, like jitter, shimmer, uh, and some prosody features. Uh, have mm -hmm. you tried with those? Uh, this kind of uh, okay. 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 Thank you very much. So, uh, starting with the first question, the sample size that we have, we have collected data, and, and by the way, this this is the effort that I we are collaborating with Harvard Medical School. We have pulmonologist working together, and we are collecting data with 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 them with their patient um, uh, admitted in in their hospital. So. Total, we have in this paper or most of the paper, we are uh, presenting data from uh, through, uh, 300, around 350 subjects, and they are having various conditions. Some of them has mild, moderate, and severe condition, and some of the, uh, them are healthy subjects because we need baseline data too. So combination of say, COPD, asthma, with variation of severity, and also the Healthy subjects. So these are the variation of the data that we have. And also we use data annotation, um, rigorous data annotation, so that we the data that we include in our analysis are high quality. Because we want to, we don't want to create some noise using just garbage data. So those are those are the data that we are going through a lot of scrutiny, and then we then we publish those papers uh, to this panel. So this is about sample size or data. Uh, data size and another uh, point about the shimmer and jitter. Yes, we use the prosody features and and this variation of the speech. For example, when I am uh, taking inhaler for a long time, my voice may be changed. The hoarseness, hoarseness of the voice will be different. Those will be captured by a shimmer and jitter, like a variation in time, a temporal, uh, like peak to peak from fundamental frequency to, to other frequency. So peak to peak distance and also the variation of the amplitude of the, of the sound, those are captured by Shimmer and Cheetah and those are really good uh, features. Another feature that we have used is pause time. Like if I have as my attack, I, I, I need to pause to catch my breath and then speak again. So those pause time is very important information that we capture um, as, an, as a feature into our model. Another thing that, uh, that you have mentioned our physiological features. We have used physiological feature like inhalation before the speech, because when, when our brain knows that I'm going to deliver something, speaking something, then it will be kind of auto, automatic from our nervous system. It will be, uh, it will be a signal going to, um, to my lung that I need to take a deep breath before I speak, because I need energy to support that speech. 
and that information we included in the uh, in the in the model and we saw this is one of the um, good feature discriminating feature when if we, we classify patient from healthy subjects yeah there, does it answer your question yeah madam? yeah thank you yeah those are the good features yeah yeah sure uh, thank you <laughs> any other question from anyone I know we are running out of time, but I'm I'm fine if someone has question or other suggestion comment. Yeah, just a quick question from me. So, mm -hmm. what's the penetration rate of these sort of solutions based on mobile phones? Penetration through the end users. What's the penetration rate rate even in the first world countries? Oh, you are talking about smartphone? Yeah, smartphone based solutions, ML solutions. Oh, smartphone based solution. Okay. I know the penetration of smartphone in the US may be around 77%, but a smartphone based solution, I have I don't have the data. Yeah, I mean, I'm not aware of the numbers, but uh, I think there should be some papers or, or, or articles we can find. Maybe I, I can send you over email later. Great, great. no problem, thank you. Mm -hmm. thank you. Any other question? So I guess, the talk itself actually gives all the questions and that's why there is no question rising right now. So thank you so much, Dr. Mahabub. And uh, now I would like to bring it back to the great organizers of this talk, uh, Dr. Atif or Dr. Rifat or Professor Mahabub, Madam, please take the charge again. Thank you so much. I don't do anything. <laughs>